Hello, everybody. That was very loud. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Alive, awake. I see some mimosas, hair of the dog, right? <laughs> so uh, welcome. What we're going to talk about today is um, just some fine tuning with OSPF. Um, this is one of those subjects on our Cisco U platform. You can find OSPF in CCNA. You can find it in Encore. You can find it in Anarsi. So as you guys are progressing through your certification tracks, this is a hot topic. So um, how many of you are running OSPF in your environments? Awesome. Now, a couple things as we're going through this. How many of you are actually running multi-area OSPF? Good. Awesome. So looks like about a third of you. For those of you that might not, this might be something that you're going to think about implementing later down the road because some of the things that we're going to be talking about in this does require multi-area OSPF. All right. So why don't we dive in? Um, this is our agenda. We're going to be looking at cost. Out of the box, OSPF doesn't really optimize cost that well. So we, as administrators, we need to go in and fine tune it. Um, we're going to talk about route summarization. So again, the only way we can summarize is by leveraging those multi-area deployments or designs. So think about that. Um, passive interfaces are just a way for us to kind of like stabilize our environment. And then we're going to also look at route filtering. So route filtering is going to be beneficial if you're going to be implementing any other types of routing protocols in your environment, BGP or any other types of dynamic routing protocols. This is a little bit about me. I just like sharing knowledge. And I recognize a couple of you guys from some of the other talks that I've done here. And um, feel free to reach out to me afterwards if you guys have any questions. So out of the box, we know OSPF uses this algorithm. It's based on cost. Cost is based on the speed of a link. Now, obviously, as we're looking at the cumulative cost, right, shorter cost to the destination is the more preferred path. Just like if we're shopping, right, we want nice low cost. Now, um, what is cost based on? We said bandwidth. But does anybody know what our reference bandwidth is? 100 megabits per second. Kind of like, huh, <laughs> that seems really old and that seems really slow. Now, we do also have the ability to do equal cost multipathing. So if we have the ability to leverage more than one path to the destination, we want to be able to use that, right? But sometimes, out of the box, we might not have equal costs in both directions. So we might want to manually tune the cost on a link-by-link -link basis in order to leverage multiple paths to a destination. All right, so a couple of you guys said, yes, default reference bandwidth, 100 megabits out of the box. So if we're looking at a 10 gig link, if we're looking at a one gig link, if we look at a 100 meg link, it's all a cost of one. That doesn't sound like a good idea, right? So we want to we wanted either change the default reference bandwidth, which is a global parameter, or we can change the cost on a link by link basis, okay? And you can mix and match. It's not one or the other. You can do both. So here we go. We have some examples of what the default cost is out of the box. One solution, of course, we can increase our reference bandwidth. So here's an example of modifying our reference bandwidth, and that will change the cost to be less desirable on our slower link paths. Other alternative is to manually configure the cost on a link by link basis. So you go into the actual interface and you use that command IP OSPF cost. So the question was, does the reference bandwidth supersede? So when you change a reference bandwidth, it's going to change it by default on the device for all interfaces. And then if you go in and manually change it on an interface, that's going to change the reference bandwidth. Always verify and double check. And when you do change your reference bandwidth, you do need to restart your OSPF process. All right. So here's an example of that cost being changed. Show IP OSPF interface brief. It's just one way to look at that cost to make sure it's verified. We can also look on the interface level. Notice that our cost has now been changed here. And after we've done our 
uh, configuration change, we can see it being updated in the route table. So if you guys are trying this out in your lab environment, you know, it's always good to verify to make sure that your cost is actually being implemented the way that you think it's going to be implemented. So make sure you're testing before you roll out in production. Next, we're gonna be looking at route summarization. So again, route summarization, we can only do in a multi-area environment. So when we have you know one router that's participating in two different areas, what is that called? Area border router, ABR. So there's actually gonna be two devices that we can manually configure route summarization. One is the ABR, the other is your ASBR. There are two different commands that we're gonna be using to summarize based on whether it's an ABR or an ASBR. So remember, each area, we have type one, type two LSAs. What's the summary LSA? Number three, perfect. So that type three LSA is what's gonna be doing the summarization for us. And again, it doesn't automatically do it. We as administrators need to tell the device how to summarize. All right, so um, benefits, of course, reducing the overall number of LSAs. That's going to optimize just the resources on our box, right? We're not going to be running the SPF algorithm as much. We're not going to be um, having to have as many LSAs in our linked state database. So we're going to look at some examples of that here in a minute. Also, just more succinct route tables. We have one destination or one link to a particular area. Why not have a summarized route? Why have this big, long routing table if we can summarize? All right, so here's a little bit more of a complicated design. Obviously, you can be even more complicated than this. I've had uh, some folks that I've talked to that had over 50 different areas. So it just depends on how much summarization you want to do, how many different remote offices you have. Um, if we're doing any type of summarization, you know, in, in one direction, it's going to make every route router in each area have a more succinct routing table. Um, remember, OSPF doesn't automatically summarize. We have to do it. So first, what we're going to do is look at an example. Here we have lots of different routes, 192, 168, 16, all the way through 23. This is our linked state database. We can see all of the LSAs. And then here's an example of a route table. So we're using the exact same interface to get to all these prefixes. So here's the command to do it. It's actually really easy. You need to go into your OSPF process. You're gonna use whichever area it is that you're summarizing. So here we're gonna be summarizing for area one. So area one range. And then we just have to make sure we're getting our mask information correct. So here we're going to be advertising a slash 21. And when we verify our database again, notice we have just one single LSA versus all those LSAs that we had before. And then when we look at our routing table, it's nice and summarized. Slash 21 right there. Everybody doing okay so far? All right. Next, looking at the summarization on an ASBR. So if you're doing you know, EIGRP into OSPF, if you're doing BGP into OSPF, this is where we introduce that ASBR. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be summarizing our OSPF routes into whatever protocol it is up there on the top right. Again, we're reducing LSA flooding. Anybody remember what type of LSA the ASBR is? Five. <laughs> You're like, that looks not in chronological order. <laughs> so um, another benefit, of course, we're uh, reducing those CPU cycles. So we're not going to be running that SPF algorithm as often. So what we're going to do is we're going to summarize the 10, 33, 4 through dot 7. So those are those type 5 AS external um, LSAs in that link state database. And then we can see them also in our route table. So by default, anytime we're doing any redistribution with OSPF, those E2 routes are gonna be the default. Keep in mind that E2 has a default cost of 20. So remember when we were going back and talking about costs before, we as administrators, we might want to change E2 to 
E1. That's a different type of external route. It's one command. Um, but what it does is it takes that default cost of 20, which is supposed to be less desirable. Um, but then we're going to aggregate any additional cost onto that. So um, keep in mind, E2 is the default if you're doing redistribution. You can always change it to E1 if you want. So summarization on the ASBR is going to be the summary address command. Slightly different. We don't need to indicate the area in this case. All right. Show IP OSPF database. We see that one single AS um, type 5 uh, LSA. And then when we look at our routing table, we also see that's going to be um, much more simple. All right, next we're going to be looking at passive interfaces, and we're also going to be looking at route filtering. So there's a couple different ways to filter routes. Um, have any of you guys done anything with prefix lists before? What are the benefits to prefix lists? Yeah, so it's going to be less resource intent for the actual physical hardware. Um, processing an ACL is definitely going to take more resources for the physical device. So prefix lists are also a little bit easier to configure. The only downfall is we can't get as granular as we can with an access list. So pros and cons to the two. Um, also, what we'll see is that with... Um, we, we, have, we have the ability to filter with route maps. We can get really granular with that. So a route map, we can reference an access list if we want. Um, and then, of course, with our route maps, we can also we can do some fun stuff with it. We aren't always just looking at, let's say, destination IP. We can look at source IP. We can look at all sorts of cool stuff with route maps. So benefits to passive interfaces. Um, so passive interfaces, I know most of you guys are familiar with this. This is you know, a CCNA topic, but not everybody is using it. It suppresses our OSPF packets. In other words, we're not sending out those OSPF hellos. So some people will like to implement this, especially to maybe interfaces towards uh, DMZs, access layer devices, because it's super easy to spoof an OSPF packet. If you form an OSPF adjacency, you can start injecting false routes. So security-wise, it's good to disable OSPF wherever you're not using it. So it hardens your routing protocol, also reduces hardware resources. We're not sending out as many OSPF hellos. And what we want to do is there's a couple different ways you can enable passive interfaces. You can enable passive on an interface-by-interface -interface basis, or you can globally enable passive interfaces and then negate it which means basically turning it on on an interface by interface basis. Sometimes that's going to be best practice depending on how many switch virtual interfaces you have, how many physical interfaces you have. So if you are going to be disabling it globally, just remember that you're going to have to enable it on every other interface. So that's the command. Keep in mind your neighbor adjacencies will go down. So if you do decide to implement this in a production environment, just make sure that you're doing it during a change window. Um, also, the no passive interface is still done from your OSPF process. You aren't going to go into the interface and do it. So no passive interface and then indicate the physical interface. I think we were doing that a little bit in our hands-on labs two days ago. So um, verify, show IP protocols. You can see all of the passive interfaces that you have configured. All right. So we were talking a little bit about route filtering. Um, basically, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be removing our routes from the route table to prevent forwarding of traffic. So when we look at the different types of filtering mechanisms, sometimes this is going to vary based on what it is that you want to filter and whether you're going to be filtering either to the next hop or sourced from the actual device that you're on. All right. So there's, you know, distribute lists, uh, route maps, prefix lists, and just keep in mind, unless you are using a distribute list, we're not going to actually be removing the LSAs from the link state database on the device that you're on, all right? So we'll look at a couple examples. The first one, the distribute list. So this is that the way that you can leverage either access list or a prefix list. And this is going to be leveraged for transmitting 
uh, your received or redistributed routes. So prefix list, pros and cons to it, right? Better performance over an ACL, but again, we can't be as granular with our, um, with our subnet masks. Okay, so here's an example of that prefix list. So from global config, we use the command IP prefix list. We give it a name. What is it that we're gonna be dropping? All right, so in this case, we wanna drop traffic from the 192.168.2. That might be an entry that we don't want being advertised into our route table. And then what we do is we permit everything else. So what we're doing is after that, we're going into our OSPF process, and then we're gonna be referencing the area, the filter list, and whether that's going to be on egress or on ingress. So in this particular case, we don't want those prefixes to be advertised to the next device. And then all we need to do is verify. All right, so we can see from our link state database, we no longer see that type three LSA. And we've also blocked it from our routing table. So if we're specifically looking for that one prefix, it's gonna be blocked from the routing table. All right, lastly is the configuration of our route filter with our distribute list. So here what we're doing is we're just looking at an example of leveraging an access list, just a super simple ACL. We're denying traffic from the 192.168.2 network and we're allowing everything else. So this, again, super easy configuration. We just go into that OSPF process use a command distribute list and we're referencing that ACL. So anything that might be coming from BGP, whatever other protocol it is that we're using into our OSPF process, we're preventing from coming in. And then once we verify, we can see that that update filter has been um, applied to the OSPF process. And then again, if we look at our routing table, um, we have prevented that route from coming in. Um, I was talking way faster than I thought I was. I think that's everything that I wanted to cover. I am gonna be hanging out for a little while, so if you have questions, let me know. Um, also, don't forget, if you guys haven't already checked out our um, Cisco U demos or the RevUp, um, if you have the opportunity, uh, you get uh, the best pace on the, uh, on the simulator you uh, get entered to win um, free access to Cisco U, which is basically our new platform for all of our certifications. Which exams did you guys take today? Or this week? How'd you do? Awesome, congrats. Anybody else take an RC? How'd you do? Got a retake in like five days. Keep it fresh. <laughs> How about Encore? Did anybody take Encore? Did you guys get some simulations? No? Yes? Yes? All right. Well, give us some feedback. Let us know what you thought and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks, everybody.